A woman mysteriously disappeared on her way home. Her friends started searching for her, and later the police joined them. Everyone hoped that she was okay and would soon return home. But just a few days later, unexpected details emerged in this case that left even experienced detectives shocked. Today, we will tell you what happened to Gemma McClaskey and why this case has shaken up all of Britain. Gemma McClaskey was born on February 5, 1983 in England. She grew up in a large family with two older brothers and loving parents. In her teenage years, Gemma decided to try her hand at acting, and since 1997 she had landed several minor roles. In 2000, when she was 17 years old, she was offered a role in one of the most popular British series called Residents of East End. In total, Gemma appeared in over 30 episodes. After that, she had to give up her acting career temporarily because her mother fell seriously ill and someone needed to take care of her. Her mother was diagnosed with a brain tumor. She was successfully operated on, but unfortunately the operation led to an infection that could not be treated. Since then, Gemma lived in an apartment with her mother and brother Tony. She worked as a waitress at several bars and clubs while taking care of their mother when away from work. It was Tony who looked after their mom during those times. In March 2019 when Gemma turned 29 years old, she continued looking after their mom as usual while going to work and occasionally meeting friends. However one day her acquaintances realized no one could reach Gemma. She didn't answer calls or messages on social media platforms, nor did she appear online. She had quite many friends who quickly suspected something was wrong. Together they concluded nobody had seen Gemma for several days already. The last time anyone saw her was when she met Eric in March. Since then there's been no trace of here online either. On the third day, Tony went to the club where his sister should have been working, but employees said they hadn't seen her yet. Tony reported it to the police, knowing well that his sister wouldn't leave without informing, especially considering their mother's condition. Investigators filed a missing person report. They questioned Tony first, given he lived with Gemma. However, there was an issue. For many years, he'd been using marijuana, causing memory loss issues and affecting his concentration. He couldn't recall exactly last time seeing his sister until eventually remembered it being March the 1st, the same day he had consumed large amounts of marijuana, leading almost to his flooding of bathroom with water. Jim averted the disaster by turning off water tap before any damage occurred. After that, the girl left the apartment to meet her friend Erica. Tony said he came out of his room around 6 in the evening, and his sister was still not there. Gemma discussed this incident with a friend in the bathroom, once again complaining about how tired she was of her brother's behavior. He worked as a window washer, but almost all the money he earned was spent on weed. Despite being 35 years old, it often seemed to his sister that she had to constantly watch over him like a teenager. The day after reporting to the police, Erica met with Tony again to discuss the situation and think together about where his sister could have gone. The man was overwhelmed, started crying, and blaming himself for what had happened. He mentioned that because of this incident in the bathroom, Gemma once again became disappointed in him. It wasn't the first time his addiction had upset family members. Meanwhile, the girl's friends contacted the local newspaper office asking them to report on her disappearance. Reporters spoke with Gemma's brothers and wrote an article. Everyone hoped that media coverage would help find witnesses who might have seen the girl. The next day, March 5th, Gemma's cousins decided to organize large-scale search operation. They recruited dozens of volunteers who searched streets and handed out flyers to passersby. The sisters also actively spread information through social networks, hoping for any clues. On March 6th, they did manage to get their first lead, but not in a way they had hoped. Tony received a phone call from an unknown number from someone demanding that £2 million sterling be taken to Benfleet Railway Station outside London if he wanted to see his sister alive. Later another call demanded an additional $500 in Iraqi currency along with those funds. 
Then there was a third call from someone threatening to harm his sister if the payment wasn't made. Tony asked for proof that she was okay, but was told she was locked up elsewhere. He added that there was violence against his sister, and urged the authorities to haste with the payment. The same person called Danny, the other brother. Police tried tracing these calls. They quickly identified Sam Dan, a 19-year-old living in Kent. His home wasn't far from where money drop-off location was specified by the caller. Judge issued search warrant for house arrest. Dan was arrested. But soon police concluded that the young man was unrelated. Seeing a post on social media, he jokingly decided to prank by calling the advertised numbers of Tony and Danny. Investigators found inaccuracies. The young man claimed the call had been made by his friend while he sat nearby. Police determined it was him who made the call, and were unable to locate others' persons. The court sentenced the man to six months' imprisonment. The detectives once again found no leads. They reconstructed the timeline of that day, and established that Jamie left Erica's apartment at around 1.17 am, and headed home. On the way, she called Tony several times, and arrived at her house at 1.50 am. This is confirmed by surveillance camera footage. After 18 minutes, her phone was turned off, and has not been turned on since then. At that point, the police were almost certain that Jamie had been abducted. But there was something strange about the timing of her movements. Most likely, it was the abductor who turned off her phone. But how could he do it 18 minutes after the woman arrived home? The most logical explanation would be that Jamie was attacked right in her apartment. But at that time Tony was there while their mother was in the hospital. Investigators came to alarming conclusions and wondered if Jamie's own brother could be involved in her disappearance. He used drugs in very large quantities, and people with serious addictions are often capable of monstrous acts. Digging deeper, detectives learned that both his sister and mother had called the police on Tony several times. Sometimes he behaved aggressively and even attacked Jamie. His behavior during the investigation also raised questions. While Danny and friends actively participated in search efforts for the woman, Tony stayed home claiming he hoped for Jamie's return and wanted to be there in case she came back. Only after this case started being discussed on major TV channels did he finally join the search efforts. Police spoke with him again trying to get more specific answers about what happened on that day. Tony said he saw her between half past one and three o'clock after which she went somewhere else. Considering her phone being switched off at 2 p.m., his account raised questions. On another note, Tony spent practically 24 hours under influence of drugs. So relying on his memory wouldn't have been entirely objective. On March 6, three days following Jamie's disappearance, this case took an extremely alarming turn. A boatman sailed along one of London's inlet canals when suddenly his vessel collided with a suitcase. The waves opened the suitcase, revealing its contents. The shocks boatman saw a human body inside. It lacked head, hands, and feet. Experts examined it immediately, noticing a tatted bow on its lower back, similar to one belonging to Jemmy. Therefore, investigators promptly requested DNA analysis for identification. They obtained DNA from toothbrush resulting as full match. The deceased person was indeed Jemmy McClaskey. Her relatives, friends were shocked by news of woman's death, as well as gruesome details regarding a body found within suitcase. No one could believe such horrible fate befell upon her. Now, police dealt with murder and everyone awaited swift capture of perpetrator. And already next day, on 7th of March, they made loud statement. Investigators announced that Tony McClaskey had been arrested under suspicion of murder. His inability to recall the chronology of that day, and strange behavior during the search for Jamie suggested that he was completely uninterested in finding his own sister, or perhaps he knew that she was already dead. In addition, the timeline of her disappearance made Tony the most obvious suspect. Judging by when her phone was turned off, it was determined that she was attacked 18 minutes after returning home. Experts concluded that Jemmel was killed on the same time. 
considering their argument over a crowded bathtub on that day, as well as his addiction issues. Police considered the possibility that he could have snapped and killed his sister. Prolonged use of drugs in such quantities can lead to serious mental health problems and a person is capable of committing spontaneous crimes. During initial questioning, detectives became even more convinced that Tony could indeed be the killer. Instead of denying his guilt in his sister's murder, he answered all questions with a single short phrase, without further comment. Investigators examined his smartphone and found correspondence with his sister. The day after her disappearance, he sent Jamie a message saying I love you. And a few hours later wrote to Gemma call me when you get this message. What are we having for dinner today? Are you working tonight? Detectives noted one strange fact. Their communication with each other stretched back many years, but he never once said he loved her until the day after her disappearance. On the same day, he messaged his girlfriend apologizing for not contacting her the previous evening. None of this pointed directly to his guilt, but soon police found much more serious evidence against him. They learned that on Jamie's disappearance date, Tony ordered a taxi to an address not far from home using a fake name Tom. After obtaining information about driver's route from company records, Investigators obtained surveillance camera footage from around their area where they saw how difficult it was for him to lift up suitcase into trunk, which appeared very heavy according to driver's testimony. The driver asked what was inside the suitcase, to which the man answered that the suitcase contained a large music system. He requested being taken near street located next canal where later body would be discovered. Questioning residents in area led police find an eyewitness who was standing near her apartment balcony and saw a man ragging large suitcase towards canal. Experts examined the car trunk and found blood traces belonging to Jamie. DNA analysis confirmed the blood belonged to her. Having these evidences detectives were convinced that Tony transported suitcase containing his sister's body. Murder charges were brought against him on March 10th. Police searched their apartment discovering even more alarming clues, a knife with barely noticeable blood stains. Bathroom also had blood stains. These facts indicated that the woman was killed in her own home. But one moment raised questions for the detectives. Considering that the head, hands, and feet of the woman were severed from the body, there should have been much more blood. Experts examined the drainage pipes throughout the house but they failed to find significant traces of blood there. They hypothesized that Tony laid down something like plastic film or tarp on the bathroom floor, then gradually disposed of the blood with a large amount of detergent. The day after the murder, Tony was caught on store cameras buying garbage bags. According to investigators, he could use them to remove remaining parts of the body from his home. Soon this version was confirmed. Divers who continued searching through the canal found packages containing legs and arms. Even without DNA analysis, everyone already understood that they belonged to Jamie, and later experts in the laboratory only confirmed this fact. Despite a serious set of evidence against Tony, he still refused to talk to investigators so they decided to change tactics. Police showed his father footage from security cameras showing Tony putting a suitcase in a taxi trunk on the day Jamie was murdered. His father was convinced that his son was involved in the murder, so he agreed to talk with him and try to get a confession out of him. This tactic worked partially though. During their conversation Tony told his father what happened that day according to him. Jamie came home and caused a scene over an overflowing bathtub demanding her brother move out of her apartment, but he refused. When Tony decided to go to his room, she allegedly grabbed a knife, and after that point, brother remembered nothing else about what happened next. Investigators did not believe this story for even one second, as it sounded like an attempt by him to shift blame away from himself. Hence they continued looking for additional evidence. On March 9th, Police managed finding Jamie's head in the same canal where finally experts were able to determine the cause of death. She received multiple blows with sharp object, which matched the kitchen knife found in her apartment. Since then detectives prepared the case for the trial while keeping Tony under arrest. 
The investigation dragged almost a year. During this period, the victim's brother slowly began admitting his crime. He eventually admitted being responsible for his sister's death, claiming he lost control during the argument, that he never intended to harm her. Court proceedings started on January 2013. Prosecutors believed that during the argument, Tony's sister asked him to leave the apartment. Things escalated, and Tony delivered several stabs on his sister. He spread tarp-like material on the bathroom, divided her body into pieces, put them in suitcase, and dumped into canal afterwards. After that, he carried other parts of the body in garbage bags. Some of them he also threw into the water. His father couldn't even listen to all this. He temporarily left the courtroom and returned only after they stopped discussing the details of his daughter's murder there. Tony admitted that most likely it was him who killed Jamie, but he absolutely did not remember it. According to him, it could have been self-defense. His sister allegedly shouted at him with a knife in her hand, and what happened next is unknown. The prosecution considered his version an outright fabrication. A psychotherapist was invited as a witness who stated that memory loss from smoking weed is extremely rare. In addition, Tony clearly planned to cover up his actions by getting rid of the body. It took him many hours to do so, and amnesia, a state of shock, should have passed fairly quickly. Not only did the brother dismember her body and scatter it across different parts of the canal, but he also called a taxi under a fake name, and then meticulously cleaned the floor in the bathroom afterward. All this indicated that Tony was well aware of what he was doing and planned to avoid punishment by getting rid of all possible evidence. A childhood friend of Jamie also testified at trial. She recounted how her brother had beaten and humiliated her from an early age, sometimes forcing her to wear sunglasses to hide bruises on her face. According to the witness's testimony, Tony always despised his sister and felt no emotions towards her whatsoever. He lived with her and their mother only because it was more convenient for him. He didn't have to pay rent or even for food. The man spent almost all his salary on weed, which suited his lifestyle perfectly. But when his sister tried to kick him out, he snapped and killed her. The trial ended on January 30th. Jury found Tony guilty of murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 20 years. In his final statement before sentencing, the judge declared that Tony disposed of Jamie's body like a true maniac, apparently hoping she would never be found. During sentencing, the killer showed no emotion, just as during the entire trial process. There wasn't any evidence that he regretted what he had done. After beginning serving his sentence, Tony was transferred from one prison to another due to someone putting a bounty on his head. It is unknown whether this is related to Jamie's murder or if he managed to quarrel with someone else among inmates. His father, who had tried with all his might to support his son during court proceedings, ultimately decided to cut off all contacts with him. The man stated that he did not want to turn away from Tony, otherwise he would lose both children at once. Moreover, this was still his own son. He simply could not abandon him. But in the end, he still understood that Tony felt not a drop of remorse for what he had done. He didn't give a damn about his own sister. In the same year, their mother passed away after a long illness. But even towards her, Tony did not feel any special emotions. It seemed like he was absolutely indifferent to his own family. But the worst part is that all this cannot even be attributed to drug addiction. He humiliated and beat Jamie since childhood. So there are no justifications left for the killer. His brother and father are forced to live with the thought of what kind of monster Tony truly is until the end of their days.